Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials, video 44. This is on cellular specialization. That's how cells become tissues, tissues become organs, and organs become us. In other words, it's how cells decide what kind of a cell they're going to become. Uh, if you're looking for a really cool TED video, TED.com, uh, I would check out Anthony Atala's uh, TED Talk on growing new organs. He basically summarizes all the research that's been going on for the last decade on growing new organs. He shows how he was able to create a bladder. He has a dot matrix printer that actually prints out a heart, so it's pretty crazy. Uh, another bit of research going on that's pretty mind-bending is that of Doris Taylor at University of Minnesota. What she's figured out is you can use detergents to kind of clean all of the cells off of uh, connective tissue. And so this right here is a, it looks like a ghost heart. It's essentially a heart that's removed all of the cells from it. So you could take tissues from or cells from a person, grow them in culture, put them on that and conceivably make a heart. I know she's made a heart that, that can actually beat. And so it's a really cool time as far as uh, organ replacement and, and regeneration. Um, but first, let's start with how does this all work? Where do cells start and, and how do they eventually become organs? And so if I were to organize this podcast, we're first of all going to talk about cells. So cells uh, organize themselves into tissues. That's a bunch of cells that do the same job. And then those eventually become organs. So example could be one cardiac muscle cell uh, makes up cardiac muscle tissue, which eventually makes a heart. So that's how it's organized. Um, how a cell decides what cell it's going to become is based on cues or based on signals that it's getting. Now, some of those signals come internally from the cell itself. A lot of the, the, the time that's based on where the cell is. Um, and that's going to turn genes on or teens, genes off, and that's going to determine what cell it's going to become. Uh, but there's also external signals. So there are chemicals that are coming from cells adjacent to that cell that are also turning on those genes and determining what cell it's going to become. Um, another really cool area of research is cells also get signals outside of the body. And so it's getting signals, for example, on temperature and a cell can use what are called heat shock factors to actually make proteins to protect them from heat or a lack of oxygen or who knows what. The, the research is just getting started. And so let's start, first of all start with stem cells. And so this is what human stem cells look like. These are ones that are growing on a medium. And so um, those cells have the potential or the ability to become all of these different types of cells. And so you could guess at what these are. You probably could guess a few. Um, this right here is fat. Uh, this would be striated muscle tissue. These would be nerves, so nervous tissue. And then these up here are uh, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells. So that'd be like the lining of your respiratory system. And so all of these cells have the exact same DNA, and they all started as stem cells. And so how does that proceed? Well, we have to go back to fertilization of the egg. So right here we have fertilization of the egg by the sperm, and that creates something called a zygote. The zygote is going to make copies of itself, and then you're eventually going to have a ball of those cells. Now all of them have the exact same DNA inside it. At this point, when it's just made a few divisions, the, each of these could separate and you could have uh, identical twins. That's one way that identical twins form. But once you've actually folded into this blastocyst or this blastula, which is a bunch of cells in a circle, uh, if we collect cells at this point, those are called pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent stem cells are those that could come, become any other cell. But they're pluripotent, not totipotent, because they can't form a brand new fetus because this blastula is eventually going to make an embryo of fetus and a new organism. And so these cells have the potential uh, to become any other cell, be it in the circulatory, nervous, immune system, whatever. They can become any cell. Once they've decided on what cell they're going to become, then they're unipotent. They can't become any other cell. They've differentiated at that point. And it's rare that they're able to de-differentiate. There are some organisms, amphibians, some things like in healing process, where they can actually go from unipotent back to pluripotent. Uh, but most of our cells can't do that. That's why it's a really neat area of research. And so how, cell, how do cells dec decide what cell they're eventually going to become? Well, like I said, they're accused internally. And so this would be that first blastula. As that blastula starts to fold, it'll eventually fold in on itself and it forms something called a gastrula. And if your cell on the outside, you form up what's called the ectoderm. And if you're on the inside, you're the endoderm. And if you're in between, you're going to form a germ cell layer called the 
the mesoderm. And mesoderm, for example, will form all the bones and muscle inside you. And so how does a cell figure out what type of cell it's going to become? Well, if we say this is a simple cell, so a simple cell is going to have a nucleus, and for example, let's say this one just has two chromosomes and it has a bunch of genes on there. Basically what happens is it's only going to express, let me get a color, it's only going to express the genes. Let's say there's a gene here, there's a gene here, and there's a gene here, and all of those create a nervous cell. And so when it differentiates, it's going to express just those nerve genes and all the other ones, so all these other ones are going to methylate or they're going to wad up and they're not going to be used. And so when a cell differentiates, decides which, which one it's going to be, it's getting clue, cues based on where it is and that's going to uh, determine what kind of a cell it's eventually going to turn into be it a nerve cell or a skin cell or even a red blood cell. And so there are cues based on that cell that tell it inside internally what it's going to become. And what are those cues? We call those transcription factors. Remember transcription is the process where we go from DNA to RNA. And so a transcription factor is a protein or a chemical that's going to cause DNA to uh, make a transcript of itself. In other words, make messenger RNA. And so transcription factors are going to be chemicals in the cell that are going to say, turn that on, turn that on, turn that on, turn that on. Right now I'm talking about like in a eukaryotic cell. This would be an example of that. And so transcription factors can come internally, but they can also come externally. And so right here we've got an embryo that's around six weeks old. And when you're five weeks old, an embryo, a female embryo, and a male embryo look exactly the same. There's no difference between the two. But at that point, the testes start producing a um, transcription factor. It's called SRY gene, or the sex determining region of the Y. And that's going to flow from cell to cell to cell to cell. And so it starts in the testes, but it's going to flow to all cells of that organism. And it's a cascade effect, almost like a positive feedback loop, where it's going to uh, trigger that SRY gene, so this transcription factor, to start making proteins that make it a boy, but it also is going to make more of that SRY. So it spreads throughout the whole organism. So at about six weeks, all of us are female. And then just because of the release of this transcription factor, SRY, we all if we're a boy, eventually become uh, a male. And so those cues again come from inside the cell or outside the cell. But what we're doing is we're regulating which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. Now an, a cool area of research is that that stimuli doesn't even have to come from another cell or from within the cell. It actually can come externally. And so an example of that is the heat shock factor. Heat shock factor, this is a picture of one of those. Heat shock factor is a protein. And what happens is if the cell senses a change in the temperature, in other words, if the temperature increases, that's going to cause transcription, this uh, transcription factor, heat shock factor, to actually move into the nuclei. And once it moves into the nuclei, then it's going to create a number of proteins. And those proteins are heat shock proteins. So those proteins are going to move into the cell. And what they're going to do is they're going to protect the cell. And so they're going to harden that cell and protect it from changes in temperature. And so it's actually changing the physical makeup of that cell just as a result of this transcription factor that's moving into the nuclei and making all these proteins. What happens next? Well, eventually the temperature goes down. We quit producing that heat shock factor and uh, we're going to quit producing those heat shock proteins and the cell goes back to normal. And so we find that not only in uh, heat but a lack of oxygen or hypoxia is actually going to produce these shock factors as well. And so uh, cells are neat. They can become whatever cell they're going to become. Uh, they can respond to cells adjacent to them based on their uh, location and they can even respond to external stimuli. So that's cellular specialization and I hope that's helpful.